Uh, hi, so let's start with the next module. Now we are moving on from biological neurons and we'll be talking about the first uh, neuron model, the McCulloch Pitts neuron, right? So again, we had covered this briefly during the history that in 1943, uh, these two uh, gentlemen, McCulloch and Pitts, one was a neuroscientist, the other a logician, who proposed a highly simplified computational model of the neuron, right? And the interest, as I said, was that our brain has neurons and they are capable of fairly complex processing. So can we come up with something which tries to mimic it, has a computational model of that, which takes certain inputs and produces certain outputs, and then maybe slowly evolves to kind of help us take complex decisions. Right? So that's the idea. And they come up with a very simplified model where you have a bunch of inputs. These inputs are all binary, right? So yes, no kind of inputs. So it could be, uh, is it training outside? Am I feeling well? And so on. And based on this, I might want to decide whether I want to watch a movie today or not, right? And uh, this neuron, as you can see, I've split it into two parts. There's a white part and I've labeled it as G now. I'll tell you what G is. And then there's this F part. And then finally, you have the output. The output is again Boolean, right? So right now, I'll just focus on the input being Boolean and the output is also Boolean. And I gave you an example of uh, Boolean inputs, which was, uh, is, uh, is it raining outside? Am I feeling well? Um, uh, do I feel like going outside and so on? Right? These are the inputs. And uh, based on that, I want to take a certain decision. Right Now, what this model does is very simple. Right? And it just follows what we are trying to show in the uh, neuron uh, example, biological neuron example. It aggregates all the inputs. Right, So there are these n inputs. It aggregates all of them. So all that the G function does is a simple aggregation and you can just think of it as a summation. It's just summing up all the inputs and these inputs can either be 0 or 1. So at max you could have all the inputs which are 1. So that would just be a sum of those 1s, right? And then F takes a decision based on this aggregation, right? So remember one of the cartoon examples I was showing was that this neuron will fire only if two out of the, at least two out of the three input neurons were uh, firing, which was is the speech funny, is the visual funny, is the text funny. If any two of three, these three fire, then this will fire, which is the same as saying if the sum of the inputs is greater than two, because the inputs are either going to be zero or one, then the neuron will fire. So this F is going to take a decision based on the aggregation, right? Uh, I've still not completely defined G and F, but we'll do that. Uh, so these inputs that you have, they can be excitatory or inhibitory, right? So first I'll just want to get rid of this inhibitory input. I'll mention it uh, a bit in detail on now and then we'll not see it again um, mostly in the course. So it may be a bit on the next slide, but after that we'll not see it. So inhibitory inputs are such that if that input is one, that means if that out, uh, input is on, then it doesn't matter what the other inputs are, the output is always going to be zero, right? So it's a bit of a uh, uh, kind of party spoiler kind of a input. And you could think of it, right? So if I'm taking a decision and if the uh, input uh, is, uh, do I have high temperature, right? If that input is on, then irrespective of whether I'm in the mood to go for a movie, whether I'm free today, whether there's a good movie outside, whether it's raining, not raining, it doesn't matter. If this input is on, my output is going to be zero. I am not feeling, I have a high, do I have a high temperature, where I define high temperature as anything greater than one, not two. Uh, then I'm not going to uh, go to watch a movie. So if I don't have any inhibitory input, right? So none of these inputs are kind of party spoilers. They're all uh, positive inputs in the sense that helping me take a positive decision. So those are the excitatory inputs, which if on are good, right? And so we'll mainly be talking about excitatory inputs. So if there is any uh, inhibitory input, right? Uh, so we will have uh, y equal to 0, that means the output will be off if the input is inhibitory, right? Now that I have already covered. Now I want to talk about the case if you don't have any inhibitory input. So in that case, your function g, which is a function of all the inputs, right? This is important, that is a function of all the inputs. And I'm going to collectively call this vector as x, right? So you have this collection of inputs x1 to xn, and I'm just compactly calling it as x. 
So g is a function of all these inputs or you could think of it as g is a function of a vector x which has uh, many components, n components and it's simply going to be the sum of all these components. That's what I was saying. So these inputs could either be 0 or 1. So this sum is essentially the number of inputs which are on, right? the number of inputs which have 1. That's what the sum is going to be. right? That's what g is. And then what is f? So f takes in g as input, right? So that's what was written here. Function f takes a decision based on this aggregation. So what is the aggregation? The aggregation is essentially g of x. That's the aggregation. So it's a function of that. And it will be 1. Let me just get rid of things on the slide. Yeah. So if it will be 1 if g of x is greater than certain threshold, right? So again, going back to that example, the biological neuron would fire if at least two out of the three neurons was on, right? So what that means is that if I had n neurons and if my threshold is 2, that means f will be 1 if at least two of the n inputs is uh, uh, on, right? And you could think of it as this, right? You have multiple inputs based on this, which you are taking a decision. So every, at least two of these inputs are favorable, that one input could be it's not raining outside, so it's favorable. The other input could be that there's a very good movie which has come out in the theater. So these two inputs are on, then you would go for a movie. So at least you want two things to be good. And this could be higher, right? So if you have, if you are a lazy person and if you go out only for very specific things, then you might want many conditions to be in place for you to make that decision, in which case this threshold would be high, right? So it doesn't matter what the threshold is. What matters is the way in which you are taking decisions, which is that you have a certain number of inputs, only if certain number of that is positive or is on, then only you will take the output as 1, otherwise your output would be 0, right? So that's all that this f does, right? So this theta is called the thresholding parameter and as I said, it could depend, uh, it could be different for different cases. It could depend on the data that you have. So if you're a lazy person, your theta might be high. If you're like an outgoing person who just looks for any excuse to go out, your theta would be very low, right? So this entire thing is called the thresholding logic where you aggregate the inputs. Then you have a theta and then based on that, theta, the threshold, you decide whether the output would be 1 or 0, okay? So now, uh, let us implement some uh, Boolean functions using this mccullough pitts neuron, right? So why Boolean functions? Because uh, the model itself only takes Boolean inputs and gives you Boolean output. So that's by definition a Boolean function, right? So you have f uh, of g of x, right? So this f is going to be boolean that means it's the output is going to be 0 or 1 and all your x's are also 0 or 1 right so you have boolean inputs boolean outputs so this is a boolean function right now what does it mean to implement a boolean function right and this is going to be an uh, important uh, theme in the course what do you mean by you're trying to represent or implement a function all it means is that if i take a standard boolean function right let, let me take the input function x uh, of a boolean function of two inputs x1 x2 right and let me call it as f of x1 comma x2 okay so i know that uh, if suppose i'm talking about the uh, and function then this is what it looks like right uh, that it gives zero for certain inputs and one for certain inputs when i say i want to have a mccullock pitts neuron or say any neural network or in general of uh, computational model which is trying to implement or represent this function, what it means is that when I take these inputs and pass it through that model, right, the outputs would be the same as what is expected from that Boolean function, right. So this from this Boolean function, I expect the outputs to be 0 in certain cases and 1 in certain case. In fact, I mean, if the 1 will appear only if both the inputs are 1. So if my mccullough pitts neuron can actually, if I say that it implements this function, then it means that when I pass the input 0, 0 here, the output should be 1. If I pass, uh, sorry, the output should be 0, uh, 0, 1 should be 0, 1, 0 should be 0, and 1, 1 should be 1. So if it can actually give me the same outputs as the original function, then I say that this mccullough pitts neuron has implemented that function or is representing that function, right? So let's, let's delve a bit deeper into that. So here's a mccullough pitts neuron, that's the basic representation where you have some inputs here for simplicity, I've taken three inputs, then you have a threshold and then you have uh, the uh, output 0, 1. So now if I want to implement the AND function, right? so I have three inputs. This is not in my control, it's just a function of three inputs. 
and the output is going to be boolean so this is fine so i have not i have drawn this as it is and i am not asking you about what should i do but i am asking you about what the theta should be right because i have not put in theta so now if this mccollock pitts neuron here is going to implement the and function then what should the value of theta be so the function should give me an output 1 only if all the three inputs are 1 right so if all the three inputs are 1 then what would g of x be it would be 3 right and i want f uh, f of g of x to be equal to 1 only when uh, g of x is greater than or equal to theta. So now what should the theta be? I want this to be 1 only if g of x is greater than or equal to theta. So I should set the theta to be 3. Right? So if I set the theta to be 3, then this function would give me 1 only when all the three inputs are 1. If any one input is 0, right? let us look at the case of 1, 1, 0. So in that case, my g of x would be 2 which is less than the threshold and my output would be 0 which is exactly what I expect from the AND function. So if I come up with a mccollock pitts neuron where there are 3 boolean inputs, 1 boolean output and the threshold is set to 3 then actually I have implemented the AND function because this function or this neuron will give me the exact same outputs as I expect from the AND function. Right? Similarly now you could see for the OR function, the OR function the output should be 1 if any of the inputs is 1. Right? So, I have given 3 inputs, if the sum of the inputs is 1, then the output should be 1 or greater than or equal to 1, the output should be 1. That means the theta should be 1 and now you can see, if I give the input as 0, 0, 0, the sum is going to be 0, which is less than the threshold, so the output would be 0. In every other case, the output would be 1, as is what is expected from the uh, OR function. Right? Similarly, I uh, will not uh, go into the uh, details of the NOR function. Uh, and the NOT function, you can look at it independently. But here just notice that this inputs, I have made them as inhibitory. Uh, so let me just explain here, right. So this is an inhibitory input. So what that means is that if this input is on, okay, if it is 1, then the output is going to be 0 and that is exactly what the NOT function does. And when the input is 0, I want the output to be 1. And so remember, it is two step, right. So if if there is an inhibitory input, then the output is going to be, uh, if the inhibitory input is on, then the output is going to be 0, that is satisfied, right. So whenever there is 1, the output is going to be 0. But if the inhibitory input is not on, that means if it is 0, then what do I want? I want the output to be 1. So in that case, I will just set the threshold to 0, right. And then now since the uh, sum, which is trivially 0 here, is greater than or equal to the threshold which is 0, so the neuron will fire, right. So this I had to do because this is a NOT function where if something is on, I want the output to be off and hence an inhibitory input makes sense here. And similarly now you can go back and check why the threshold 0 makes sense for the NOT function, right. So that is that's how this is. So now the question is, can any Boolean function be represented using a mccollock pitts unit, right. And to answer this question, I think we have been just in this uh, arithmetic world, right, where we are just taking g of x and then applying some threshold and seeing what the output is. So to answer this question, I think we need to go into a bit of a geometric interpretation, right. So let us see what the mccollock pitts neuron is actually doing, right. So I will go to this, uh, this equation or inequality here, right, which is x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to 1, right. And for a minute, I will ignore the inequality oops, I will ignore the inequality and just replace it by equal to, right. So now x1 plus x2 equal to 1 is the equation of a line, right, all of us know this, right, and this line is already drawn in the figure below as you can see. This would be a line which passes through the points 0, 1 and 1, 0 right, because 0 plus 1 equal to 1, 1 plus 0 equal to 1. Of course, there are many other points on this line, but we know that <coughs> these two points lie on the line, right. And I only care about, since I am living in a Boolean world, although this is like a two-dimensional plane that I have drawn here, 
there are only four points that matter to me. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, because my inputs can only be Boolean. So the inputs of the form 1.1, 1.2, all of them are not possible. Only Boolean inputs are possible. So in my Boolean world, there are only four points. And the x1 plus x2 equal to one line is the line that I've drawn here, right? Now you can see that what is the macaulay pitts neuron doing? Actually, you, your decision is x1, if x1 plus x2 greater than or equal to one, then the output would be one, else the output would be zero. So essentially, the macaulay pitts neuron is drawing a line such that all points which lie on or above the line, right? And on or above, I'll use this word on or above now, but later I'm going to replace it by something else. The output is going to be positive, right? Because these are the points for which x1 plus x2 is greater than or equal to one. And you can see that if I substitute 0, 1, 1, 0 here, it will be equal to one. And when I substitute 1, 1 here, the output would be two, which is greater than one, right? So for these points, the macaulay pitts neuron is going to give the output as one because if they are greater than theta, theta is equal to one here, hence the output would be one. And for the point zero, zero, this is going to be zero, which is lesser than the threshold, which is one, and hence the output would be zero, right? So all points lying on and above the line, the output is going to be one. All points lying below the line, the output is going to be zero, right? A more correct way of saying this is that for all the points which lie in the positive half space of the line, positive half space of the line is all the points which satisfy this equation, right? And negative half space of the line is all the points which satisfy the equation x1 plus x2 less than 1, right? So for the points which lie in the positive half space of the line, which is the shaded portion, the output is going to be 1. And there are only three such points in our Boolean world and the output is indeed 1 for them. And for all the points which lie in the negative half space, and there's only one such point, 0 comma 0, the output would indeed be 0 for that point, right? So what the macaulay pitts neuron is essentially doing is it's dividing your space of inputs into two halves, one which lies in the positive half space and the other which lies in the negative half space. And for all the points which lie in the positive half space, the output is 1 and for the other points is 0, right? So we'll now, uh, let me just delete this so that people who want to read the slides can read it while I'm talking. So now what we are going to do is that we are going to convince ourselves about this statement that this is actually a line. All you are doing is drawing a line and then the points are divided into two halves, positive and negative half space. Let's try to convince ourselves about this if it's not already clear from this example, right? So let's, let's just see. So now let's look at the AND function, right? So what's the equation, what's the inequality there? x1 plus x2 greater than or equal to 2. So again, for a minute, I'll forget about the inequality and just say x1 plus x2 equal to 2. And that's the dark orange line that has been drawn here, right? And it makes sense. The point 1 comma 1, which is one of the four points that I care about, actually lies on this line, right? And that is the only point in my Boolean world which will satisfy the equation x1 plus x2 greater than or equal to 2. If I substitute any other point, then it will not satisfy that equation because x1 plus x2 would be 0 or 1 in that case, which is less than 2. So all these points lie in the negative half space of the line and the point 1 comma 1 lies in the positive half space of the line. So again, you have this division of the inputs. There are four possible inputs into two half spaces. And for one set of points, the output would be 1. And for the other set of points, the output would be 0. Same way you can think of uh, the tautology function, which would be the threshold there would be 0, right? Because you want it to be always on. So even if the input is 0, 0, you want the output to be 1. That means if the aggregation is zero, still you want the output to be one, which is simply saying that the threshold can be set to zero, so that for zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one, all four of these, the output would be one, right? And this is the line, x1 plus x2 equal to zero that you see here. And again, you can see that all the four points in my Boolean world, they lie in the positive half space, or I can loosely say above the line here, and there's no point which lies below the line. So all the points are in this one group, and they'll always be one as is expected for the tautology function, right? So the main uh, <clears throat> takeaway, well, before we go to the three point example or three input example, not three points, three inputs example, is that the macaulay pitts neuron is essentially drawing a line, right? And that's a linear decision boundary, which is separating the input points into two parts, right? So that's the main uh, takeaway. Now, what if you have more than two inputs, right? Often in two dimensions, it all makes sense. So as you know from uh, the linear algebra course that 
uh, now instead of a line, we'll have a plane, right? And let's see what that looks like, right? So for the OR function, if you take that as an example, then 0, 0, 0 is the only input for which I want the output to be 0. And for all the other seven inputs, I want the output to be 1, right? So now I would, before even I show the figure, I'm trying to imagine what it should look like. It should look like that I have like a plane such that 0, 0, 0 lies on one side of the plane and everything else lies on the other side of the plane, right? That means I would have divided my inputs into two parts such that on one side I have inputs for which the output is 0 and there's only one such input and on the other side I have all the inputs which are seven inputs for which the output is 1, right? So let's try to see that. So this is again, I'm in a Boolean world. So even though I'm in three dimensional, I don't have infinite points. I only have eight points, the 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way up to 1, 1, 1. You know how to construct those eight points. And now I have this plane, right? Which is actually the plane x1 plus x2 plus x3 equal to 1. That's the plane that is there. And of course the points 0, 0, 1. So let me just slide it down. Oops. Oh, I may not be able to write here. Okay, so the I'll write it later on. I let me just uh, be here, and you can see that uh, if I have this plane, then the point zero comma zero comma zero is below this plane, and all the other points zero zero one, all the other seven points. I'm not going to call them out. They are either on the plane or above the plane, right? And that makes sense. Because for the OR function, as I said, the output should be 0 only for this one point, which is shown in red, and it should be 1 for all the other points. Right? So this triangle that you see is the plane, and you can see that there's only one point below the plane, and everything else is on or above the plane. right? And uh, if I want to go back to the, so, uh, so uh, arithmetically, what was it? x1 plus x2 plus x3 is equal to 1. Right? That's the plane, that's the blue triangle that you see. And uh, you can see that uh, except for the point 0, 0, 0, any of the seven points will give me an answer which is greater than or equal to 1. Hence, they lie in the positive half space of the line. And the point 0, 0, 0 will give me the sum as 0 which lies in the negative half space of the line. Right? So, this the main point here is that this is not restricted to two inputs. For n inputs, three inputs, n inputs, it will all the analogy would be the same. The geometric interpretation would be the same that you will have a hyperplane. And you'll have points lying on one side of the hyperplane and points lying on the other side of the hyperplane, right? So the story so far is that a single Mikolaj Pitts neuron can be used to represent Boolean functions which are linearly separable. Right? So what do I mean by linearly separable? I have not defined that yet. Uh, so linearly separable, linear separability in the case of Boolean functions simply means that there exists a plane such that all points for which the output should be zero lie uh, on one side of the plane. And all points for which the output should be 1 lie on or the other side of the plane, right? And positive half space and then I get That's all that linear separability means, right? So that's the story so far that McCulloch Pitts neuron can be used to implement such a linearly separable uh, Boolean functions. And later on, now the question is, of course, what happens if there is a Boolean function which is not linearly separable? And before that, do such Boolean functions exist which are not linearly separable? So these questions will. Uh, address as we uh, go along.